uh, joining us is Dr. Lucas Morgan, our psychologist, as well as Dr. Courtney Nunokawa on the team. And of course, we have Dr. Rita Bell Fernandez, our geriatrician. I want to remind everyone that this CME activity is jointly provided by the Queens Medical Center and UH Jabsom Department of Geriatric Medicine. Um, we are all willing to teach and share our collective experience and wisdom with you. Uh, as a reminder, please note that evaluations are required for your CMEs. You can find evaluations by following the link in the chat at any time on our website and also through our email advertisement. Your comments are very important to us and it's useful in the planning of future programs here with ECHO. A little bit about ECHO, we wanna emphasize that this ECHO webinar, it truly serves as a forum for mutual teaching and learning from experts and also from each of us on the front lines. As the ECHO motto goes, all teach, all learn. And so it will take all of us to create a community of learning. Here's a little background again on the format for ECHO. It will start with a short lecture from our subject matter expert. Then it will commence with open comments from the expertise of the ECHO Hub team members. And you, the attendees, participants' comments are greatly welcomed along with questions or examples of case discussions. Lastly, we ask that you please uh, keep cases HIPAA compliant. And this includes not sharing the patient's name, birthday, address, and so on. We learn best from our patients and our clients. They are our best teachers. And so I want to take this opportunity. It's such a treat for us today and for me to have Dr. Karen Lubomir as our guest speaker who are going to be speaking about insomnia and older adults. Um, Dr. Lubomir wears many hats. Uh, and some of those hats that she wears is she currently is a geriatrician with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Pacific Islands Healthcare System. And she works with a home-based primary care program. In addition to that, she's also an assistant professor with the Department of Geriatric Medicine at the John A. Burns School of Medicine. And she serves as the clerkship director for geriatric and palliative medicine, again, with the John A. Burns School of Medicine. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Lubomir. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for inviting me today. I don't know about that expert part of insomnia, except that insomnia is um, overrepresented in older persons. And I think it's a very common complaint. So as by being a geriatrician, I have become an expert in many uh, subtopics that would, um, I definitely help manage this condition for older adults and their caregivers, I think as everybody can attest to. So let me begin by sharing my slides. I have nothing to disclose, but let me get to my talk for you and we will get started. So here I am. Um, all right. So some of the objectives I have today, um, I'd like you to be able to define insomnia because, you know, people just like, I always say, just like diarrhea, people have different kind of definitions. So I want everybody to be on the same um, page because it actually in, um, is implications for how we manage this um, problem. Um, and I'd like you to be able to list three risk factors. Why do older adults seem to have um, uh, this overrepresented in their population? And then what are two non-pharmacologic and then two pharmacologic interventions if we get to that point? I am going to get rid of all our pictures. Okay, there we go. So that's, there we go. So some of that definitions, I put this in quotes, we're gonna look at the DSM-5 as well, our psychiatry colleagues. But the first thing is, it takes longer than 30 minutes to fall asleep. This is sometimes referred to as initial insomnia or onset of sleep insomnia or um, sleep latency problems. Um, another um, condition that may uh, signify insomnia is if you wake more than three times a night or if you, when you wake up, you have prolonged awakenings. This is referred to as middle insomnia or difficulty with sleep maintenance. I have a little asterisk there because 
older adults experience this more frequently than younger um, persons. Um, and then again, here's another uh, thing that we may hear is staying asleep for less than six hours. This is considered late insomnia or early morning awakenings. And then lastly, um, included here would be persons that experience sleep that's chronically non-restorative or described as poor in quality. Our DSM-5 uh, criteria would include that this has to occur on three or more nights per week. And it's got, uh, they say it's associated with some impaired daily function, either complaining of fatigue, daytime sleepiness, poor concentration, uh, that would further define this problem. So let's look at a case. Well, this gentleman looks pretty happy they're asleep, but maybe daytime. So we have an 82 year old male resident. You have a residential care home. He's got a past, you know, a history of diabetes, dementia, enlarged prostate, and he suffers from arthritis. He moved into this residence from his daughter's home about one month ago. So what's happening here? The caregiver comes in today and said, you know what? He goes to bed about 730, but he can't fall asleep. So he kind of lays there and watches television till 11. He frequently, um, when he does fall asleep, uh, he gets up frequently during the night. It disturbs the other residents. That's likely where you're hearing about it um, when he has to go to the bathroom. And then he seems to be um, sound asleep at eight o'clock when they're trying to get him up for breakfast. He's complaining a lot to you. He states he needs a nap for an hour or so after breakfast and then again after lunch. He frequently refuses to attend appointments because he's just too tired. So a couple of things about insomnia um, in older adults. Does he have a sleep problem? Why can't he fall asleep at night? Why does he keep waking up at night? And why is he so sleepy the next morning and during the day? So looking at some of our definitions previously, you know, these are, he, <laughs> he has problems with all of them. Yes. So I would say he does have a sleep problem. So just a reminder about sleep stages and cycles. Um, so stage one, when we first get in bed is the lightest level of sleep and that lasts about one to seven minutes it's kind of when you're right after you drift off um and h2 is the also and that lasts between 10 and 25 minutes again it's a lighter sleep body's relaxing it's best to wake up during the stage hence when you hear napping should be less than 30 minutes this is why, because it's, you have some a little bit of restorative um, sleep here, but not so much that you're falling into deeper sleeps, which then comes into stage three, lasts longer. Your body and your brain are recovering. If you wake up during this stage, you're very groggy. The last stage is really REM sleep. Some people call it stage four. Some people call it REM sleep. Um, this is where you have the activity, the population, vivid dreams. It's not considered actually very restful. And if you feel, if you wake up during this stage, you definitely uh, feel um, that you haven't rested. So here's kind of a typical, and this little schematic is a typical eight hour sleep cycle. You're in and out, you know, you're drifting off and in and out of REM sleep until you wake up. We, one thing we know about older adults, one of the classic things is their circadian rhythms change. Um, so here is a younger individual, kind of the standard phase as it would. Um, they're sleepy or around 10, 10.30, they go to bed and they fall asleep and then they wake up. Okay, pretty refresh, straight through. What happens in older individuals, they're at, their phase um, is um, they get sleepy earlier. So they may go to bed. Whoops, sorry, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to get rid of that. Sorry. Um, anyway, I apologize for that. Um, anyway, six o'clock, they go to bed. Okay, they're having lovely sleep. They, or they get sleepy, they go to bed, and then they wake up. But look, we've reset them. It's now 4 a.m. They have been in bed or have the same amount of time in bed, um, but they're waking up at four. The rest of the house is asleep if they are, or every, uh, there's nothing to do at that time. Their circadian rhythm has been reset. Other age-related changes we see in sleep, so the total um, amount of sleep that people get with age typically decreases. The latency or that time it takes to fall asleep will either increase or no change has been seen. Sleep efficacy, that's the time asleep over the time in bed, like how efficient are you when you're lying in bed? Um, this also decreases in um, older adults. Daytime napping will increase. 
the earlier or the lighter stages of sleep, the um, first and second stage, will increase um, time spent in light sleep. Uh, slow wave sleep or the deep that restorative sleep we looked at will decrease as people age. The percent time in REM sleep will also decrease and their nighttime awakenings um, will increase. Um, in dementia, I wanna point out that sleep efficacy um, is impacted as well as the time spent in lighter sleep um, will increase with persons with dementia and nighttime awakenings also increase. A few sleep facts as you would. I dropped my earbud, so I'm sorry. I'm just looking for it, one of my ear swabs. Um, about 50% of older adults report sleep problems. And in, but insomnia is not considered a normal part of getting older. They report more trouble falling asleep, so that's the sleep latency, and sleep maintenance or staying asleep. They spend less time in the deep or the REM sleep, so that's stage three or the REM sleep. And there's more time spent in those lighter sleep stages. They actually wake up more frequently for a variety of reasons. Um, and they, so that interrupts their entire sleep cycle. And when they wake up, they feel less rested. And then we know that older adults sleep between six and eight hours for a 24 hour period on average. Oops, sorry. Oh, getting them all again. Oh, here we go. Um, I just, it's just a little bit of a uh, schematic about how sleep changes from infancy into old age. So you see the periods of wakefulness are um, much um, increased as persons get older, okay? And non-REM sleep also increases. So how do we evaluate sleep? So one thing is to ask, is the person satisfied with his or her sleep? Do they have, um, does sleep or fatigue interfere with daytime activities? In other words, are they needing, feeling that need to nap as our gentleman in our case? Is there a bed partner or other person that can report um, complaining of unusual behavior? So that's the snoring, the kicking, the thrashing, needing to move, um, interrupted breathing, leg movements. Um, those are our screen clear, sorry. Um, when you would also wanna go on to review their medical history, all their prescriptions, including over-the-counter medications, and then a good review of systems. I'm performing a focus physical exam that includes mental status testing, as well as depression screening. And then um, something that's pretty critical is to ask them to keep, or their caregiver to keep a sleep log for about one to two weeks, because there may be patterns that um, evolve that you can then evaluate. And then from there, Look, do we need further testing? Something like um, a sleep study if indicated. So some of the patterns that you want people <laughs> to observe, um, you know, how many hours were they spent sleeping in 24, especially important if people are napping frequently during the day, their exercise, um, the time they wake up for the day, the time they go to bed, how much sunlight exposure are they getting? What about use of our, uh, what about screen time? including computers, our phones. Um, what are they eating and drinking? How soon, um, how close to bedtime? Caffeine, actually, we think, you know, about six hours or so, but some people are affected for up to 12 hours and can interrupt um, sleep. And don't forget the sodas, and it's not just the green tea and, and uh, Starbucks. And then naps, how many and how often are they being taken? And then how much time are they spending in bed when they're not sleeping? That's that time to sleep ratio. So those are some of the observations. Some of the risk factors for insomnia, um, it's too noisy, the temperature's wrong, there's too many lights on. If they are hospitalized, never a place to get rest in the hospital, but also if they've recently been hospitalized, very disruptive, maybe to their circadian rhythms. And then if they've made some move, our gentleman moved to a residential care um, um, facility, but or even just moving to a new house or new setting. Some of the behaviors that we know are that risk, increased risk for insomnia, going to bed at all different times. There's no set schedule. You know, about, we talked about caffeine already, alcohol use near bedtime, why it might put you to sleep. It actually produces a fragmented sleep over the night. And then a death or a, um, a lifestyle change um, can severely impact sleep as well as some behaviors. 
um, medications, medication, medication. You'd be surprised how many have um, side effects. And then um, in under medical problems, so things like uh, we've already alluded to, some of the uh, sleep disorders, dementia, depression, anxiety, diabetes, heart disease, strokes, pain, and things like Parkinson's, multi-system atrophy, or Lewy body type dementia. Those can all be risk factors for having sleep problems. So what are some of the next steps in evaluating insomnia? So those conditions that I've just listed for you, other things I would suggest would be things like pressure sores, reflux, PTSD come in there, dysphagia, especially in our older population, having post-nasal drip, um, untre um, osteoarthritis. And then we, so you ask, are the conditions under control? Is there untreated pain that we need to be addressing? Is, is the individual depressed or anxious? Hence the... Um, psychologic screening for depression, anxiety, or um, cognitive impairment. Oops, sorry. It should be three. I apologize. So some of that number three is checking for signs and symptoms. And those are things like the restless leg, periodic limb movement, or sleep apnea. Again, or sleep uh, log or that uh, bed partner or Caregiver may be able to provide some information there. And then reviewing your medication. Some of the top ones I always think of are diuretics, prednisone or steroid use, even inhaled steroids, albuterol inhalers with its beta adrenergic, and acetylcholinesterase. Again, older adults, if they're on dementia medications, uh, can be very stimulatory. So do we? how do we manage sleep problems? Non bright red, non pharmacologic is the best way. So, sleep hygiene, stimulus control, sleep restriction, cognitive uh, therapy, and paradoxical intention. The last three are usually done under the supervision of a, a physician or a therapist. Um, so, these non pharmacologic treatments, do they really work? Well, it improves probably 78% of patients with primary insomnia. And the good news, the effect lasts for at least six months after you've completed um, the treatments. This is not so for pharmacologic um, agents. When you stop them, the effects stop. So non-pharmacologic management, the first one we kind of grab onto, sleep hygiene. This helps with falling asleep, so sleep latency, and sleep maintenance or staying asleep. This is about education, 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 health, environmental practices that can affect sleep. Used in combination with other sleep techniques, very, very effective. So what are some of those other techniques? Things you're probably already familiar with, light therapy, socialization, exercise during the day, especially you have been used in um, assisted living settings and long-term care settings with, um, again, in combination with really um, good results as a, and very useful in persons with dementia. The uh, light therapy, as you know, improves circadian rhythm and it, it helps establish a healthy sleep-wake cycle. So sleep hygiene, diet, you know, no big chocolate cake before bed. So health factors, uh, diet, exercise, substance use, alcohol is um, uh, not helpful. And though I know one of my patients would say, oh yeah, I just give him a shot of crown oil before bed, dad before bed. And he goes, passes right out. Well, he doesn't stay asleep because he has, <laughs> it interrupts uh, later stages of sleep. Um, looking at pain. Uh, dysphagia, or trouble swallowing. They may be um, having um, difficulty managing secretions at night. So that's waking them up. Um, symptoms of medical problems, things like GERD. Um, environmental factors to take into place, light, noise, room temperature, mattress has been stated. Okay. The next one is stimulus control. So that's cueing the body and the mind ready for sleep. Any of you have children know, if you have that nice bedtime routine, we have dinner, we brush our teeth, we have our nice warm bath, right? It's preparing the mind and the body for sleep. And this helps with that sleep latency or getting somebody to fall asleep. So to only go to bed when sleepy, use the bed only for sleep, establish bedtime routines, and have a regular morning rise time. 
and going to bed and getting up at the same time. Very effective. And then avoiding those long, avoid napping at all if possible. And no naps over 30 minutes. Remember the most, uh, the second stage of sleep um, is when it's you feel most rested. So anything longer than 30 minutes, uh, not beneficial. The next one is usually is done under um, um, the direction of physician, therapy, therapists, um, other providers. Um, and that's help, going to help with middle of the night awakenings, and it helps improve sleep efficacy. That time you're spent in bed is really spent sleeping. So the goal is anytime the person's in bed, they're, a, they're spent sleeping. Example, let's say somebody goes to bed at 11, and then they get up at 8. So they had oh, this full nine hours in bed, but they wake up so much during the night, they're actually only getting about six hours of sleep. So your intervention is going to be only let the person go to bed at midnight and get up at six, that's six hours. That's what they're typically getting. If they begin sleeping through the night, you can let them go to bed a little bit early, 15 minutes up to 30 minutes earlier and keep increasing that until you get the um, amount of sleep that's true, um, truly efficient. Um, the wake time has to be constant and you're adjusting um, the bedtime gradually in this case. And it will allow a short afternoon nap again less than 30 minutes. Other non-pharmacologic management, this a little bit, uh, have to be a little bit higher cognitive level, but this is gonna help with some of those psychological problems that may interfere with sleep. There's less anxiety and depression typically. And it really um, involves either any dysfunctional beliefs, attitudes about sleep itself, and may help replace um, those with uh, adaptive um, behaviors. It helps minimize the sort of anticipatory anxiety and arousal that many people may have because, oh, if I don't get my sleep, I'm not going to be any good tomorrow. <laughs> or if he doesn't get sleep, he's going to have a bad day, those kinds of things. Um, it teaches relaxation techniques. Again, you have to have somebody cognitively um, really be able to participate in this. Then there's something called paradoxical intention. And I put it in smaller Letters. I've never tried this, but perhaps somebody in the group has had some success with this. And this paradoxical intention helps with falling asleep. It basically reduces sort of the performance anxiety. I have to get to sleep. Um, and any of you have struggled with sleep or latency, sleep latency, you're laying there. Why am I still awake? Why am I still awake? But imagine this has become a chronic um, pattern. But so what we do, what we are telling patients to do is to... Um, you have, when you get into bed, you must stay awake. You cannot fall asleep. Keep, and it's trying to engage, you know, sort of this feared behavior um, of staying awake and reduce the performance anxiety about trying to fall asleep until eventually that diminishes. So now let's go on to pharmacologic treatments for sleep problems, not recommended for long-term use. As you recall from one of my earlier slides, um, these are uh, non-pharmacologic methods, are much more effective, have long-term um, benefits, even when, uh, even after all, after treatment. So prescription that is um, given should be selected based on the underlying problem. Is it latency? Is it maintenance? There are a lot of over-the-counter non-prescription medications out there and you, you need to ask about them. Probably the one that gets the most press is melatonin. Um, they, melatonin at low dose is, um, um, it's well, it's, about, it's produced, we know we th always think of the pineal gland, but it's actually produced all over the body. Um, the GI tract, the thymus, even bone marrow produces melatonin. Um, it's involved in regulating the sleep-wake cycle. Uh, there's receptors all over the brain, and it's how to help with sleep latency, so that falling asleep period. Starting low in older adults is what's recommended. Higher doses will have increased side effects. Uh, next day, um, sleepiness, headaches may occur. The next uh, kind of more major class that we see are antihistamines, so that's diphenhydramine or um, uh, doxalamine. Doxalamine is very uh, long acting, uh, but you'll see that if you read labels, I, I forgot the exact brand names, but um, they're out there. I know Costco actually makes one. Uh, these have lots of anticholinergic side effects, not at all recommended in older individuals because of risk of falls, confusion, 
um, uh, constipation or any retention, on and on. Uh, anticholinergics are um, rather considered evil in older adults. Then there's all those herbal pre preparations. Oh, because it comes from a plant, it must be okay. Well, valerian root is one and it, it, it inhibits um, or stimulates uh, GABA amino, uh, GABA bu amino butyric acid release. And if you remember, that's a, in a neurotransmitter that's a main inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter um, in the brain. So when it binds receptors, it increases sleep. Um, chamomile um, tea or chamomile in pill form is um, uh, the uh, flavonoid apigenin binds to actually benzodiazepine receptors in the brain, inducing calmness, reducing anxiety. And then there's kava. Uh, the big caveat with this one is uh, hepatotoxicity. I'm not sure the mechanism, maybe somebody else knows. So anticholinergic, I talked about the antihistamines. Um, here are the prescription medications out there. This is a list, it came from, this came from the geriatric review syllabus, uh, the most recent version. Um, and here are the different classes, benzodiazepines. Let me, I get, I'm just going to do this right away. <laughs> Put my big X on that. But temazepam is listed. Um, it's a benzodiazepine, high risk for um, addiction and lots of side effects, like good motor and cognitive effects. Really uh, recommend against using it in older adults. Um, you will see some um, uh, clonazepam used in older adults with REM sleep disorder, in, especially regarding Parkinson's disease. I've seen it used by your neurologist who are very skilled, um, but to reduce risk of injury. People with REM sleep disorder have all kinds of behaviors that can um, may be injurious to themselves. Um, and then the short-acting non-benzodiazepines. Um, these also bind the GABA um, benzodiazepine receptor. Um, the ones that you're probably more familiar with is Zolpidem or Ambien. Uh, Zeliflon is also out there. Again, in, if you can look at the first comment on all of this, increased risk of falls, increased risk of falls, increased risk of falls. And then the next ones are the melatonin receptor agonists. We talked about this helping with sleep um, latency and um, um, improving the sleep wake cycle, uh, melatonin involved in the sleep wake cycle regulation. Again, um, definite side effects with this, with both of these. Arexin uh, receptors, these two out there, they also are, um, they're antagonistic for the neuropeptide arexin. Arexin is really um, involved in wakefulness. So if we Antagonize the receptor, then uh, it helps induce sleep. Again, side effects, next day somnolence, impaired performance, um, contraindicated in people with narcolepsy um, because of these side effects. And then last of the sedating antidepressants. Um, that's doxepin, which is a tricyclic antidepressant. Again, lots of side effects. Um, antagonizes our uh, antihistamine or the H1 receptors. So we have all, all those um, side effects. Um, Rumtazepine, which is actually um, a tetracycline um, uh, receptor agonist, antagonist, and that um, antagonizes serotonin receptors. This works because at very low doses, this is not, you see it at higher doses when we're treating depression, but at very low doses, um, the, we see more of the um, antihistamine effect of this medication. So that's why hence the 7.5, I've even seen it given lower. And then lastly, um, trazodone, also a serotonin modulator. So um, that's, these are both off-label, these last two. Um, one other effect of trazodone, though, you see at very low doses, but it will again increase risk of falls and or has orthostatic side effects. So, other considerations about medications what's the goal? Okay, we're going to pick the Medicaid. If we are getting to that point, everything else has been tried, we need something. Um, we want to either look at latency or maintenance. And so, you're going to really dose um, and select according to what the symptoms are. Safe for prescribing practices would be lowest effective dose. Older individuals are much more um, prone to having side effects. They're actually more responsive at the, uh, they'll see a greater response at lower doses as well. Intermittent use, so maybe two to four times a week. 
short-term use, two to four uh, weeks at max, definitely less than 90 days. And then uh, tapering um, to reduce the side effects of stopping medications recommended. So that's, the, I think of, this is uh, talked about with like things like benzodiazepine, although where's our front? I wish we had Chad here, but um, dose reduction at least by 50% for the first two weeks, but it may take even longer to totally wean people off. Benzodiazepines, depending on the what they've been on and for how long, can take a very, very long time, a year or longer. Working, I work with psychiatrists with that as well. Um, so let's go back to our case. 82-year-old male resident, and he's in his new residence. We know all about that. He's telling us all these problems. And he's complaining, needs a nap, so he has uh, poor sleep efficacy, right? He's in bed a long time. He's got all kinds of bad sleep hygiene. <laughs> and we can pick all kinds of things here. He's getting up to the bathroom. It's, you know, we need to look at his sleep log. And then he can't make it through the day because he's so tired. He has, um, you know, a poor quality of sleep. And it's impairing his ability to function the next day. So what could be causing it? One is it just that we look at his situation first. No, we're not just going to give him melatonin or no, um, some over-the-counter Benadryl or something to make him sleep, but let's look at what's happening. He just moved in someplace new. He's in a strange environment. Is he anxious or depressed? We need to deal with that. He, we know blue light is horrible, so it decreases the production of melatonin and um, uh, maybe very stimulating, depending on what he's watching. You know, it's not you know, animal world or something, some, you know, war movie or something other uh, that might be very stimulating. And then he sleeps in, in the day and night. I mean, he's sleeping until eight o'clock. And so he's not really making that association with bed and sleep. And then he has needs a lot of daytime nap, which is also decreasing his nocturnal um, time that's effective. So his medical problems, again, we can pick on things, diabetes, high or low blood sugar, maybe that's waking him up. Um, he's got arthritis, we know, in his knees. Is he in pain? Um, and that, um, it wakes him up, he, or he can't get comfortable, maybe it's back pain. Um, I work with a geriatric psychiatrist in the VA, and her favorite sleep aid at night is acetaminophen. That would be her one thing. She makes sure, because especially in persons with dementia that can't um, articulate or localize pain, she loves to see the benefit and it works very well. And then he, we know he gets up a lot during the night. So, you know, he has probably uh, prosthetic enlargement. Um, is he drinking a lot of water at dinner? Yeah. So those kinds of things need to be, can be, needs to be addressed. So in summary, asking about sleep, exploring their complaints, What's about the environment? Are there any underlying psychological issues? Reviewing their medical problems that might cause sleep um, disturbances. Look at their medications. What are the side effects? You'd be surprised. Um, you know, getting Hippocrates out and really knowing what they're taking. Ask people to journal either their caregivers or themselves everything about sleep, what their activities are around sleep, what their habits are, how much time they're spending in bed, what their meals are like, how much fluids that they're drinking before bed. Then your focused physical exam. Um, have them come back, review their journal, the observations. You know, maybe you need a sleep study at that point. And then educating people on the non-pharmacologic methods. And if needed, care, after careful consideration and exploring all other things, um, there could be pharmacologic treatment for a short period of time. Okay. Am I on time? Oh, I made it. Just three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, very, very fascinating, very excellent timing, a lot of information, and, and um, really, really appreciate your presentation today. Um, and it's a topic that affects all of us, literally, as individuals and as providers, and it affects everyone we work with. So, um, yeah, very, very cool, complex topic. And uh, I'd like to start by maybe checking in and look, going through our panel and seeing what the different sort of uh, domains represented by our panelists, how they might look at the issue of insomnia and what, what we might be thinking about. So, so Sarah, how would social work sort of be looking at this or what might social work want to add to um, what was talked about today so far? 
For me, the biggest takeaway, and I think this is true not only for social work, but all our interprofessional team members, is assessment. So there were two big takeaways, and that, that I think you hit it on the nail a few times, is it has to be a very thorough assessment. And I think there's this misconception in the community that insomnia is a normal part of aging, and you can't do anything about people having insomnia when they're older, and you just crush that by saying no, you know, because it impacts everyone. Um, as a social worker, you know, besides cognitive behavioral therapy, some things you can often try, and probably Lucas already knows about this, is um, I've used techniques such as helping people use imagery or visualization to, um, and I incorporate that with breathing exercises, getting people to relax by breathing in and out. And that's kind of part of my Tai Chi background is the use of breathing um, as well as anything to help with muscle relaxation, you know, but I, I don't think I would do yoga uh, at uh, <laughs> before you go to bed, you know? So that's the that's key thing to about when you exercise because you, you don't want anybody going to a Zumba, a gold Zumba class, or nowadays it's pickleball. And then, you know, like it, it's, read about you laugh. You know, this is true. People are still playing pickleball at like 5.36 in the, in the evening and they wonder why they can't fall asleep. But as social workers, de definitely those are the two um, takeaways for me, but it might there be other social workers have comments as well that are, I see a few other people here. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, Rita Bell, anything to add from sort of the physician perspective um, today? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lubinmir, for a beautiful presentation. You discussed the pharmacological treatments and many physicians, especially in primary care settings at the FQHCs, we are very hesitant to prescribe benzos. So a lot of the docs prescribe melatonin. And, and I do see an uh, error that we make is we, we tell them to get melatonin at Costco, Long's. And, and what is the usual dose? Three milligram, five milligram. And your talk uh, brought home a very important point to start melatonin at a low, low dose. Uh, one milligram would be ideal. And, and uh, I thank you for doing this Hanaho presentation, because when you presented to the care home operators and the foster home operators, that was something many of them commented on, was the melatonin that they're picking up from, from the stores, the gummy bears, maybe to, to higher dose. So I, I really appreciate that, uh, that uh, point in your presentation. I would like to say another thing. I am from India. And we do have a yoga for sleep. And I'm gonna share that link. And this yoga comes from the, it's called yoga nidra. And it comes from the Sanskrit word uh, where nidra is sleep. And I'm gonna put this in the link. Uh, it's yoga nidra, which helps in relaxation of every part of your body. And it goes from head to toe. And even in the military, when you wonder how do the troops sleep, they are, you know, they move around to different places in the world. They they have jet lag, they have all of this. And even military is all about, you know, going through each different body part and helping you relax and sleep. So please do check out this uh, video, uh, Yoga Nidra. Thank you. Thanks I just want to make, oh, sorry, Lucas. Um, I just want to make a point. Just uh, take home. The body only produces a hundred micrograms of melatonin. So when you're giving, think of that. We give people are giving five, you know, my, milligrams to our older individuals. I mean, you know, we're flooding the system. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, and putting that in perspective, as far as the the units of uh, of melatonin, I had no idea. Um, that's a lot. So. Um, Sorry, and I was just saving that uh, YouTube video from from Rita Bell because I, you know, um, uh, people are always looking for something to help them with sleep. So even having another YouTube video of something like Yoga Nidra might be might be just a thing that your person might find fits with them. So thank you for that resource. Um, so Courtney, how would uh, someone 
with an APR and background be looking at this or anything that pops into your mind about today's topic? Yeah, there's so much. I think sleep is really multifactorial. And that was a really great presentation, Dr. Lupamir. Um, I, I I agree with all the other panelists. I think the assessment piece is really important. And I think we often, you know, even in our, our non-geriatric individuals miss a lot of these, these lifestyle factors that are contributing to sleep. Um, another thing that comes up is I think sleep often feels really catastrophic for patients when they're not sleeping and they're not, you know, if it, on day six of really bad sleep, it feels like, how am I going to get through another day or another week? And, and so it becomes this urgency and it feels like this urgency to uh, prescribe something um, and, and really getting rooting back to the behavior change and, and encouraging the behavior change. A metaphor that I like to use with my students is the toolbox, you know, so how can we increase the tools in the toolbox? I love all these recommendations of yoga nidra and different relaxation tools. And some, some tools might work really well. Some tools might not work and just let go of the ones that don't work and, and really root into those ones that do work. So a lot of great recommendations today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Courtney. Um, and uh, just to add a couple cents as a psychologist, um, I think uh, Dr. Lubimir, you spoke a lot to the mental health aspects of sleep. And of course, it's interwoven on so many levels with um with behavior, emotions, and cognitions, which are sort of the three big baskets that that psychology is is looking at, and um, you know, I think number, I mean, in in the clinic that I worked at for the longest, we all agreed, all the providers agreed that there's if there's one thing that we can improve across all the patients and clients that came in, regardless of their diagnoses in the DSM five. If we could improve one thing and nothing else, it would be sleep because sleep affects everything else. And it's this bi-directional relationship. Sometimes sleep is affected by the diagnosis in question. So, so PTSD is an obvious example. Um, nightmares, you're not gonna sleep well if you're having nightmares. And so treating PTSD could hopefully help improve sleep, um, but it's bi-directional because if we're sleep deprived, if we have low energy, we have low motivation, it's going to be a lot harder to um, focus and sustain our motivation for engaging in behavioral goal, uh, behavioral changes that are going to lead to improvements in our, in our mental health, um, in our behavioral activation, right? It's going to be really hard if we're sleep, depri sleep deprived. Um, exposure therapy is going to be really hard if we're sleep deprived. So, um, Number one is helping folks understand how important sleep is to all facets of their health and well-being, even their relationships. And a big thing for any kind of self-focused change is that self-care is actually a way that you can help care for other people. Because if you're not taking care of, of yourself, including your sleep, it's hard to be your best self for everyone that, that you want to be, be good for. So... Um, helping folks see that looking at your sleep is actually a way to contribute to your loved ones um, when self-care can feel selfish to a lot of folks, you know, especially in local culture. It's like, I don't want to be selfish, you know. Um, so uh, anyway, um, and one last thing is that mindfulness and acceptance-based uh, treatments and practices can be really helpful for that sleep urgency um, or having this uh, anxiety about sleeping and because instead of fighting against the thoughts and the anxiety about sleep, mindfulness practices can help us change our relationship to those thoughts so that even though they come up, we are changing our relationship to them and are less sort of alarmed by their presence. Um, so just another another avenue of resources for uh, for for sleep stuff specifically. So um, thanks everyone for, for throwing in uh, a few cents to this uh, fantastic presentation so far and wanna open it up for folks in the, who are joining us today to, uh, to ask questions or, or uh, provide some commentary. Thank you.
Dan, you had your hand up. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Karen. That was really excellent. Good, an excellent overview. Um, yeah, I have a, a way way too much to say about this topic, actually. Um, but I I want to agree with everybody. Uh, I think that it's important to recognize that sleep, diet, and exercise. I regard those as the the three pillars of health, and so good sleep is really is really important. Um, the reason that we sleep, I think that understanding a little bit about the sleep physiology is important that there's the clock dependent alerting system that has to do with your biological clock that sort of rises in the daytime and might dip in the middle of the day for some people and then rises again. In fact, that's why you take a, an afternoon nap after you eat, not because of the food, but because of the dip in the, in the alerting system. And then it drifts off at night. And that is opposed by a thing called sleep debt. And that says that the longer you're awake, the greater debt you have and the more you need to sleep. And the reason I bring that up is that, uh, is that it, has a, it has a lot to do with the things that Karen was talking about. So the sleep log is really an excellent tool for clinical practice. And it's, it's good to it's good to find a good one. I don't know, Karen, if you can recommend a good sleep log, because sometimes there, there's a lot of them out there and some of them are not so telling as other ones, but you want to know when somebody's in bed, when they sleep, when they're awake, when they're out of bed. And there's sort of a way to mark that on all of them. But I want to uh, some, oh, go ahead. You, Karen, you were going to say something. No, I, there are, I didn't, you know, this was 30 minutes, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm so happy you brought that up because just looking at sleep logs could be its own topic. And I think, and um, we could probably put some in there, but there are some um, from the American Association of Sleep Medicine actually has a good one, which I think it's called Your Sleep. I That would be probably the one I don't, I can maybe type it in the chat, but there are there are sleep logs out there, but that, I, because it's from the um, American Association of Sleep Medicine, I might um, trigger that one. I haven't used it personally. Uh, Dr. Lubinmir, if you share that, we will. Uh, John will put it on our website because we have all the handouts and uh, we can list this for uh, you know people can always access it. Thank you so much. So the the other things the the sleep hygiene is really important. The room should be dark, quiet, and comfortable, and the temperature should be a a degree or two cooler than your normal what you think of as your comfortable daytime temperature. So that's a that's a sleep hygiene hygiene matter. Uh, sleep melatonin. I I want to uh, uh, thank you so much for saying that. It it is physiologic in microgram doses, and you go to the store and you buy milligram doses. The store what you buy to take as a pill is a thousand times stronger than what you what is used in your body at as physiologic doses, and. And, and I think melatonin is really overused. Melatonin does not make you sleepy. Melatonin's role has everything to do with that sleep-wake cycle. It sort of signals the dark phase of the sleep-wake cycle. So it's really useful for, for uh, like phase disorders, like uh, uh, travel, you know, uh, uh, jet lag. It's really useful for things like jet lag and phase disorders. Where, like if somebody's sleeping all day and they're not sleeping at all at night, melatonin could really be good to trigger that dark phase, usually an hour or two prior to the to the to the bedtime. Um, but as a sleeping medicine, it's not that effective. I would think that things like chamomile and valerian root, uh, you know, and and kava, you you gave a sort of Hepatic toxicity, you know, people in Hawaii were, and in, in the, the Pacific have been drinking kava for forever, you know, without without uh, too much too much bad news about it. But you back into pharmacological stuff about it. Uh, and another point that I forgot that I forgot to mention about sleep hygiene is that is keeping the same get out of bed time is really important. And you said that sleep uh, restriction could be, you know, needed to be done with the guidance of a, of a provider. Maybe that's true, but 
But sleep restriction is really good for people that are have insomnia because it goes back to that model of, of why we sleep. And that is you're, you're increasing the sleep debt. <clears throat> and the more you increase the sleep debt, the more you got to pay it off by sleeping. And so sleep restriction says, get out of bed at the same time. If it's seven o'clock, seven o'clock. You know, if you're not sleeping, if you're only sleeping two hours a night, then you get into bed at five o'clock. You sort of go with it. Get into bed at five o'clock, get out of bed at seven o'clock. And you do that for a while. And then you sort of slowly move that get into bed time back, back, you know, a half hour, 15 minutes, a half hour, a week at a time or two weeks at a time. And then you build up that's that's sleep, a sleep consolidation technique. So that's also very useful at helping people who uh, who are not sleeping at all or having really fragmented sleep to sort of get that sleep back into a into a single unit. Uh, and and then I usually say don't nap during those times either. I I say no no daytime naps for that. So you're really restricting sleep. And you're sort of forcing them to sleep in this limited way. It's pretty effective, really surprisingly effective at doing it. And geriatrics, you know, the older geriatrics, I don't know, but younger geriatrics, it's still effective. And then the one other thing that was sort of hinted at that wasn't really explicitly mentioned was the technique called progressive relaxation. It was sort of hinted at, I might, maybe it's that, I don't know what the, the yoga was that, that Rita Bell was talking about, but I just tell them, you know, start at your feet and crunch your toes up and hold them tight, 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 and then relax and feel the toes relax. And then you go to the ankles and then you go to the knees and you go to the, the thighs and you sort of work your way up the body. And it might, to do it right, it takes about 10 minutes, 15 minutes to do it correctly, but it's really a good technique for sort of initiating that that habit of relaxing in order to go to sleep. So I'll, I'll shut up, but thank you so much for letting me chat about it. I think sleep is very interesting. For those who don't know me, I'm a primary care internist. And uh, yeah, so thank you, appreciate it. Appreciate those comments, Dan, thanks. More, Dan, more. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Sorry, no, I just, Lucas, I want to point out one comment in the chat from uh, Renata, and I think it's excellent. And that's uh, going to Costco and just picking up any old melatonin. Um, there are studies that have looked at um, what is, you know, how much melatonin is actually in. And um, I think one of the best ones I found was in, done in Canada. They looked at 31 preparations. It had like between minus 83% up to like 500%, you know, um, composition of melatonin. So, you know, it's, it's not, it's a dietary supplement, non-regulated. So, yeah. Very, very interesting. And, you know, I, I do, it, it's amazing how, you know, humans are, uh, you know, we're not basically rational creatures. Right. And so, which is why, uh, the placebo effect you know, is, is so powerful. Um, so if someone was a person who, you know, believed that if you gave them something to take, that it would help them sleep, what would be the, the least harmful thing to, uh, to suggest in a pill form? I'm just curious. Mean other than Tic Tac? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Maybe that I, is, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say maybe that acetaminophen idea would be I, like that, right? I'm one of my favorite geriatric psychiatrists. That's her go-to medication. Yeah. Because we really have untreated um, and our older cognitively impaired individuals cannot tell us they're in pain. So really very helpful. Thank you. Well, um, I saw a couple things in the chat about um, uh, Fitbits for tracking sleep technology has been, you know, really trying to get at helping us understand sleep. And then Courtney, you mentioned biofeedback tools, Oura Ring, Whoop, and Apple Watch. Are those also for tracking as well or for other aspects of, of sleep? 
Yeah, I'm seeing more and more um, patients come in with the war rings and the Apple watches and they'll come in with sleep data. And, you know, I think um, I've had variants. So one, I had a patient who had an Apple watch and an aura ring and there, the data was variable from both of them, but it's something, you know, it's a way to automate the sleep log since, you know, the sleep log in and of itself is a behavior change to get people to, to journal it. Um, so it's a tool that people can potentially use to help track it and understand how you sleep. Karen, Definitely. Sarah, I just had a question for you from the perspective of working with family caregivers. Um, do they have a lot of influence over people, older people's sleep wake cycles, would you say? Especially if the caregivers up till 2 a.m. watching Korean soap drama drama. <laughs> they want it to match their own. <laughs> that, that's one thing I find. You know, they want people, so they put people, you know, people are put to bed at like, oh, right after dinner. Well, what time is that? That's why I know. And I'm seeing Dr. Uh, Devi on here and why we think it's so important to ask about sleep in our, you know, to the caregivers. Like, so tell our average day, you know, oh, so they go to bed. Oh, I put them to bed at 6.30. 6.30, are they sleeping? No. <laughs> you know, so I think they really want it, you know, they either want them quiet so they can do their own thing or they want it to match the family or the, the situation. So it makes it tough. But they're the ones that are complaining about the person sleeping all day because yes. they haven't <laughs> regulated that wake sleep right. cycle. So, thanks. Uh, it's important to emphasize that thing about uh, devices and screens too. You know, screens, you, you're shining. When you shine lights in your eyes, you're telling your body to wake up. This is about stimulating the, the wake sleep cycles. So when you shine lights in your eyes, you're saying, wake up, wake up. You know, you're telling your body to wake up. And so that really fits into that whole picture. You know, no screens two hours before bedtime or something like that is a is a good practice. And uh, just in the last few minutes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It, it, no, you need to finish up. I just see Dr. Murkowski on here. And one thing it does, persons with traumatic brain injury also have a disordered sleep. And I see Dr. Murkowski who does spinal cord injury. <laughs> so I'm going to pick on her a little bit. But um, I don't know if she wants to comment, but that is something that persons with traumatic brain injury will experience um, uh, sleep disorder as well, and potentially insomnia. I don't know if she has a comment or not. Sorry, Rachel. You might be uh, indisposed. Yeah. Oh, there she is. Sorry, I had to unmute. Can you just repeat your question again? Oh, just about traumatic. I know that person said I didn't cover it at all because this was in older adults, but we know older adults have traumatic brain injuries as well. And that is another area in insomnia or sleep disorders that we see. Um, we can see persons who've had traumatic brain injury. And I know in your work with spinal cord injury, some of them may have had. I don't know if there's any comment you can make about that. Yeah, I mean, it's fairly common with our, our patients who have traumatic spinal cord injuries. They do oftentimes have concomitant traumatic brain injuries. Um, and insomnia is an enormous component of what they face, headaches and nightmares and all kinds of things. So um, yeah, your, your talk to me is very pertinent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for raising that uh, that issue. And um, well, a couple minutes left and uh, there was a, a question about chamomile tea. And I think you had mentioned that it, it sort of uh, binds to receptors. Um, um, yeah, the GABA. The yep. GABA um, uh, benzodiazepine receptor. That's how it binds, and it goes, you know, using for like anxiolytic, calming, yeah, relaxation. So there is something to it. Yeah, very interesting. Um, one question about CEs and how do we uh, get? Uh, so, Michaela, could you speak to the the question about CEs? Yeah, absolutely. So we currently have our CME designation through Queens, and they're preparing the end of year report for all the CMEs. So you should be receiving an email from Queens CME office with your your CMEs for the year, sometime in January. They're they're trying to get that ready. If you need it urgently, 
you can reach out to the office and ask for it. I do ask that you only reach out with truly urgent requests, though. If it can wait for January, please do, because they're really overloaded right now. But they did say that they would respond to urgent requests and get it to you if you really need it. For those who are needing their social work CEs, Sarah sends those out monthly. If you did not receive one, please reach out to us and we'll help you, we'll help you coordinate that. So I'll put a couple of these emails into the link. The Queen CME office is um, this one. And then Sarah, can you put your email in there as well for the social work one? Thank you. And again, please just reach out to Queen's Only if it's truly urgent with that. Sorry, I got this one twisted around. It's cme at queens.org. Use for that second social one. social workers, you too have to make sure that you've done those evaluations. So how, you, how I know to give you the CEU attendance letter is we're actually, we're able to look at the evaluations, the responses. So right after this, do it right away so you don't forget and then our IT person sends that to me a week later. Thank you. So Renata, I see that your question, um, the behavioral health echo uses the iEcho with the one registration and then everybody joins just using that same registration each month, correct? If that's what you mean, then yes, we will be moving on to that new system um, and we can have an explanation for that uh, as we transition to it. Um, our CME provider will remain at Queens and they do, they issue CMEs once a year in January, unless uh, it's needed urgently. All righty. Well, hello everyone for showing up today, spending some time with us and for um, Dr. Luby Mayer for this wonderful, super important presentation. And so I really appreciate everyone's, everyone's participation. So happy holidays. We'll see you next year. Thank you.